All right. Well, yeah, let's let's jump in. Um, so Igor, thanks for joining us on uh, the pair program. This is a little bit of a impromptu episode uh, called, a, you know, more of a founder's fireside uh, where we talk a little bit more about your specific journey uh, to, you know, where you're at in your seat today as the, uh, you know, as the CEO and the founder of uh, Prion. Um, and so maybe uh, a starting point would just be kind of just giving the, the listeners a little bit of a, an overview of what Prion does, uh, the problems that you're solving. Sure. In, in, in some ways, I think there's not a centralized library of information, um, of, of knowledge that enterprises have. I, I think one of the things that we saw in, in, in our previous experiences and, and uh, throughout corporate America is that everything that we need is kind of strewn about all over the enterprise, right? Whether it's structured, unstructured information, some are in wikis, some are in cloud storage, some are trapped inside of uh, applications. Uh, a lot of it is is trapped in our minds as tribal knowledge, and so we decided to uh, jump into the fray and then and then develop a platform that can solve that. Excellent, yeah, it's exciting stuff that you're building there. Um, we obviously are are cued in as we're helping to uh, you know help build out that uh, those teams over at Prion uh, Engineering Product Data Teams. Um, I I would say uh, just a, some, a little bit more background and context in terms of you know where you all are headquartered and um, the size of the company at this point from a headcount perspective would be helpful. Yeah, so I mean, we're we're 30 growing to 50 uh, in the in the short term. Um, and um, we're headquartered in North Carolina in uh, in Raleigh, North, North Carolina. Uh, but we have teams in New York and in, in Boston, uh, in Seattle. You know, that's that's where we have some concentrated hiring on our on our R and D and our technology teams. But certainly, um, you know, with the work from home uh, movement, you know, you can be re- remote everywhere. You know, including Timbuktu, for gosh sakes, and and work uh, for our team. Excellent, and um, you know, I think uh, you've got a, a very fascinating journey. Um, I'd love to, uh, you know, pick that apart a little bit and and talk a little bit about uh, you know, how you got to where you're at today. Um, why don't we, you know, start start from the from the roots? You know, um, I guess where where did you, you know, where did you grow up, and uh, what got you, kind of got you into the world of technology? Yeah, so uh, my parents are both artists. I was born in Greece, um, and that's pretty much as an idyllic background as, as you can get. Uh, I came to the States, not speaking English uh, when I was uh, six years old, uh, and then just started poking around computers. It's one of the things that got put in front of me. Uh, my grandfather was a watchmaker, so I was just fascinated with him working on these complex little mini machines, um, uh, if you will. Um, you know, spent some years going to high school in Montreal uh, as well, and then started engineering school um, uh, at first as a nuclear engineering candidate, but then I switched over to computer engineering because I felt, holy smokes, if I, if I learned, uh, you know, about these thinking machines, I'm going to be able to work in any industry and affect, you know, the futures of anything you can think of, whether it's healthcare, automotive, you know, big in, in industrial uses, uh, enterprise, consumer, it really didn't matter. Computing was going to touch everything. And I wanted to give myself that flexibility to adapt. Uh, over time, and that's why I chose that that as a as an educational background. So when you came to the states, uh, where were you uh, based? Where were you located at that point? Yeah, F- Philadelphia, which is you know pretty pretty nice, still you know uh, diverse, you know lots of international folks uh, there there as well. So it's just a you know really nice uh, environment uh, to uh, you know to grow into. Mm-hmm. But then. Um, you know, my parents decided to uh, move to Montreal for a spell. And my mother did not, until years later, uh, tell me uh, that she had a choice between put it, throwing me in an English school or French school. And she just threw me into the French school um, um, just, you know, for me to gain that experience uh, as, as well. And in hindsight, that was the right move. Um, it didn't seem that way at the time as a, as, a, as a teenager, right? Because not only are you trying to keep up with all your coursework, you're trying to do it in a language that you literally didn't speak, you know, um, at the outset. And, and so that's, that's a situation of throwing the baby in the pond and, and uh, for, for it to learn how to swim. Yeah. Toss right into the deep end. Um, that's fascinating. And, you know, uh, it's kind of like looking at your, your background, it seems like, um, you know, when you, uh, 
got into you know your first career you know out of college i guess what 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 was the the company that that uh, you ended up joining yeah so i'll date myself but you know what there was no googles there was no facebooks right um and i mean it was before ebay and amazon and the rest of these companies as well and so the company that had an international presence that had um, an inclination to work on every piece of this, right, of, of the system, right? So think hardware, software, networking, uh, and the like was IBM. And so I started my career as a research engineer at IBM Microelectronics. And then halfway uh, through uh, that experience, I moved over and I started leading an advanced group that was working on early AI uh, before anybody was calling it uh, AI. So this was, you know, speech recognition, translation. Um, you know, text, uh, you know, text to speech, dialogue management, basically all of the building blocks of, of what people would eventually uh, come to know as uh, AI assistance. So you're doing R and D, uh, in this, uh, world of AI before AI was a big thing. Um, spending, uh, spending a lot of time, uh, in IBM, I take it was just based in their North Carolina, um, campus, um, was this out in, uh, yeah, I was, at the time, I was uh, in uh, based in Charlotte, North Carolina, um, but most of our teams were spread all over the globe. And because they had a really nice uh, hub airport uh, for, you know, what um, what's now American Airlines, what used to be U.S. Airways, I just decided to stay there because in one jump I can get to, you know, London. I can get to all the places I needed uh, I needed to go since our team was, you know, literally worldwide in Japan, you know, Eastern West Western Europe and, and the like. Um, but then there was a plot twist, right? They didn't, they didn't move as fast as I wanted them to move. They, they were, this was pre, uh, I guess, IBM Watson, I, I, I take it. Um, yeah, we were building Watson before it was called, uh, Watson. Uh, and, um, you know, for three years in a row, I kept hitting, hitting my head against the wall, you know, trying to get, um, essentially a new form of AI greenlit. Um, and they didn't do that. And, and that's why I departed and, and uh, did my first startup. Let's talk about that first startup. Um, what was the name of that startup? Yeah, it was called Yap, uh, which is an absurd name in hindsight. Uh, we, we weren't sure what to name uh, the company. And so my brother's dog uh, barked. And I said, all right, we're going to call it Yap. <laughs> and, and what's the company color? It's like, well, it looks like an orange lab. So let's, uh, let's choose orange and, and Yap as... Uh, as uh, as the artwork behind this thing and it was really um ahead of its time right that was founded in 2006 by 2007 we were uh, um at the first ever TechCrunch disrupt conference showing um uh, showing something off where i was speaking into a razor flip phone and words were coming out and nobody knew what the heck i was showing them at that time and in parallel and in secret we were working uh, with the Apple team on a prototype iPhone that was based on the iPod OS that nobody knew uh, was was happening at the same time. Um, and and um, what people didn't know is I was showing them Siri before Siri and Alexa before Alexa. Wow, that's wild. Um, just to, to kind of wrap my head around this, what, what year was this? Oh, that was in 2007. 2007. Yeah, it definitely was... Uh, doing a little bit of backpacking at this point with an iPod. Uh, did not have a, a, an iPhone at this point, but um, really innovated before its time. Um, and so, you know, this is a big leap for you. Um, you know, you uh, you transition from you know one of the the, the world's largest technology companies. Uh, you start your own thing. Um, was this bootstrapped? Uh, did you, you know, seek out any sort of, uh, you know, capital or funding, uh, or was this something that you just had your savings and, and jumped into it? Yeah, well, uh, savings went to zero, right? That's first phase. The second phase is uh, angel financing, and then the third phase was uh, uh, venture capital. Um, so we we're just shy of fifty people as well. We also built a very strong R and D uh, capability. That's one of the things that that is 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 true to form. Uh, for us is we tend to build uh, companies that have the ability to build all of the engines and vertically integrate the whole stack inside of uh, our platform ourselves. So um, I know it's hard for for uh, all of you out there, listeners, to tell one AI company from another, but I can tell you 
Some are basically glorified integrators. They're just taking bits and pieces of, of public cloud, whether it's AWS, Azure, uh, GCP, and pulling it together into a solution. The rare one that I can actually can own the whole engine stack. And that's something that I believe uh, in strongly, similar to Apple owning the chips, owning the operating system, owning the applications. What you end up doing by owning the whole stack uh, is is uh, controlling accuracy, scale, security, and latency, you know, at peak form. But guess what? It's a lot more expensive uh, to build, uh, and it requires just you know very heavy um, uh, R and D um, uh, capabilities in order to build that out, and a great platform team to take those engines and put them uh, into into production. But I like that from the standpoint of flexibility. And again, going back to my artist parents. It basically means, you know, you know, we mix the paint, but we also know how to put pictures on canvas. Yeah, real fascinating uh, approach to uh, to building a company. Um, so you you put a lot of emphasis into R and D. Um, you're you know building a, a team. Do you have you know your first few hires here? I'm always curious to know how how those are done. Are those friends and and family, or you know folks maybe from you know your IBM days? Um, how does the team start off uh, at Yap in the early stages? Yeah, I think uh, I, I don't know what what everybody else's startups are like, but uh, it tends to be skull and bone style recruiting in the beginning, right? Where where you're going to known quantities, you know, folks that you know their temperament, you know their 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 skills and talent. And you tend to um, pull them in as the initial nucleus of, of uh, the company. And I have to say that lasts uh, quite a while. You know, I would say the first 50 people are, are, are the most important hires, you know, because they essentially set the tone for culture, temperament, expectations. You know, they get a lot of uh, these are the folks that you're going to solve product market fit with. You're going to develop some of the initial IP. You're going to get known for that. And then... Uh, and then when you open up the aperture and hire, you know, everybody else that's coming is looking for leadership and mentoring from those individuals uh, as well. So, you know, that that adage of measure twice and cut once doesn't happen here. It's measure 10 times and, and cut once because it's no nonsense. Um, individual contributors are our first phase. And by the way, you may regard them when you interact with these people as individual contributor, but when you actually look at their CVs and their bios and their LinkedIn profiles, you'll notice many of them had, you know, executive and C-suite experience in the past, but they show up no nonsense, just, you know, uh, you know, uh, under uh, just a software engineer or research engineer, engineer or scientist title, but you don't realize that they have 10, 20, 30, 40 years of experience in, in some cases. Yeah, it's, it's well said. I, um, I think back to some of my first hires, uh, at Hatch and, you know, my, uh, my business partner was the first, first individual that I, I hired 10 years back, uh, Kevin. So he was, uh, uh, you know, uh, buying into the vision, I think is a really important piece here in that early stage. Um, you know, we get a lot of, a lot of companies that are always talking about, you know, we want to hire like a startup and, you know, when you dissect that and you peel that back, like, what is that? What does that mean? Even though, you know, they're not a startup, they're 500, 700 employees. Um, it's, it's really about, you know, making each hire as if, you know, that, that one bad hire could, could sink the ship. Right. And so you really want to be particular about culture. Um, you know, they're in it for the right reasons. It's not just because the comp was, was X and, you know, I got to work wherever I wanted. It's, it's more about they're buying into the, the subject matter behind what they're building, uh, and so I think that sounds like, um, you know, a lot of what happened at, at Yap. Let's fast forward a little bit, um, you know, from 2007 uh, to, you know, 2010, 2011. Tell me a little bit more about where Yap's at at that stage. Yeah, so uh, we ended up becoming the, uh, so there was no market for early AI assistance. So it turned into a Skunk's Works uh, project, right? So we were maintaining it behind the scenes. Nobody really saw it. Um, other other than certain big tech companies. And so when I was raising my Series B uh, financing round uh, at the time and started syndicating uh, term sheets, I think we had term sheets from Intel Capital and um, Telefonica and, um, and a couple others at the time. I think maybe Sequoia was planning on dropping one Mayfield and the rest. Um, when we went to syndicate those with some of the uh, some of the big tech companies that could be strategic investors, they started jumping tracks. Uh, over uh, to M and A discussions, 
And so Amazon dropped an offer, Google dropped an offer, Microsoft uh, lowballed us, uh, and others were uh, spinning, spinning up to drop offers like Nuance, which is now owned by uh, Microsoft. Um, and so um, I, gave, I, I gave our team a choice. I'm like, would you prefer Amazon or Google? And they actually wanted to go to Amazon, even though uh, they were going to make less on comp uh, at the time, because they wanted to go where there was going to be a completely blank slate and and would allow them to essentially put their fingerprints in something brand new uh, versus getting blended into an existing speech recognition team. At the time, what people didn't know about our company is that we were probably the first AI cloud company. We were processing a mess of, uh, you know, uh, people's voicemails, converting them into tax, mining phone calls for contact centers uh, and, and, and the like. And so we were growing hand over fist. Um, but, um, you know, Amazon wanted exclusive access to the technology that we were building. We were their first AI related acquisition, and it was supposed to be on the down low and very hush hush because they didn't want anybody to know that they were uh, building, um, you know, the Amazon Echo. So Amazon acquires the the technology here um, around 2010, 2011. Yeah, yeah, and in uh, our R and D team as well. So the Boston site, uh, the Cambridge site at Amazon, didn't exist until they acquired uh, our company. So everybody just kind of swapped badges, if you will, and, and the whole company disappeared into uh, into that fold. And the code name of of the engine that we developed. Uh, was Prion, and that's why we ended up reusing it for uh, for this company name. I see. So, what was your specific role um, post acquisition? It was just a transition over, and then with uh, the fellow that eventually became their lead um, uh, for product management, just helped them draft a strategic plan for how this stuff would would roll out. And I just went on on sabbatical. And the this is the technology that is known as Alexa. Is that accurate? Mm -hmm. Is there a backstory on where that name came from? Um, well, there's the coincidence that it's my older sister's name. <laughs> okay. um, that's a coincidence. But uh, they owned a long time ago, I think during uh, Web 1.0 days, uh, they acquired a company called Alexa Internet Rankings. So they already owned uh, the name. Uh, and then it's it's actually a pretty good trigger word because of, of, um, of uh, the phonemes that are in it. Uh, and, um, also that there's, there's some connection to the library of Alexandria, uh, as well. Gotcha. Um, so this is a, it's gotta be super flattering for you, right? I mean, this is two tech giants that are, you know, kind of competing for this acquisition. You all make a, a conscious decision on who you want to go with. You go with Amazon. Um, you know, what does this do for you and your, your self-esteem? It's gotta be, a uh, uh, pretty uh, re remarkable accomplishment that you're pretty proud of at this time. Yeah, that's, that's the complete opposite emotion <laughs> that, <laughs> that I would have felt. It's, it's look, objectively, you would think that it props up your, your self-esteem and things of that sort, but don't forget by default founders uh, tend to have a chip on their shoulder anyway, and they're runaway freight trains. So that doesn't necessarily fill that gap. Um, I would say it's surreal. And it's surreal because um, because you remember how many people thought that the initial idea was impossible and who's ever going to use that and there's going to be no business case associated with it. Um, you know, you remember testing it in the back of cocktail parties uh, and people thinking that you were uh, schizophrenic uh, talking to, to yourself. And so when it actually does get realized and you start seeing Super Bowl ads and everybody talks, it's it's part of pop culture and and. Uh, and things of that sort. Um, all I can tell you is it's it's surreal. You know, there's no arrogance that gets triggered. That's uh, well, you know, I'm right about everything because I was right about that. Um, surreal would probably be the word that I would I would use it. Now it does it does um, you know give you a sense of you know, trusting, I guess, um, you know, some of your early signals, if you will. Right. And it makes people more apt, you know, to, to pay attention, but it's, it's not a weapon, mm -hmm. you know? Well, I, I think it also is a, you know, it's a, it's a, a sense of some credibility, of course, as well. Um, you know, this is, uh, probably a, a bit of an instrumental 
step in your career that for you know foreshadowing to you know what we're what you're building here at at prion um you know really helps uh from uh you know i can tell you firsthand from a recruiting perspective right that story uh partially while we want to get this uh story you know out, out there and and um you know bring it to to light is you know there's there's a lot of value and um you know aligning with a company that has a leader with this type of you know comes from this background um between the uh acquisition and uh prion um i guess you know prion you you founded was it in 2017 mm -hmm. what's happening between these years um for you know i guess about 5 years here what what was your your journey like during this um this time period yeah and 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 i'm uh, what's curious for your listeners is that first, when you asked, hey, what is Prion? I basically said something that sounded like enterprise software gobbledygook. And then we talked about Siri and Alexa. And, 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 and now we're catching our own football. And so now, you know, it's like, oh, OK, what these um, um, uh, folks are doing is they're making an enterprise version of an AI assistant that's leveraging the knowledge of the enterprise. So it's interesting, you know, it's like act one, there's like some mystery, it feels like an M. Night Shyamalan movie. And then act two, it's like it gets revealed the backstory. It's like, okay, now act three, this is what they must be doing if I put, you know, two and two together. So I would say, you know, the gap between the two is just a, uh, an exploratory phase, you know, looking at what's happening in analytics, looking at what, what's happening in cybersecurity. I picked up a couple fellowships at the time, one um, uh, being an Eisenhower fellowship where I went to the Middle East to compare and contrast the innovation ecosystems uh, between the Israelis and the Jordanians. Um, I picked up a Truman National Security uh, fellowship to look at the intersection of venture capital and startups uh, in uh, mil the military intelligence uh, complex as well. Filed a few patents, you know, started getting them granted as well for different ideas. Um, and um, while Jiro dreams of sushi, I went to sleep one night in January uh, 2017 and then dreamt up uh, a new form of AI and woke up and said that was very peculiar. And I, and I scribbled it on a little um, uh, on a little notepad and then started calling uh, buddies of, of mine at Alexa and saying, hey, you need to steal this idea. <laughs> this will solve some of the problems that are inherent in the, in the architecture. And they're like, um, holy smokes, that's pretty interesting. Uh, get it funded and we'll join you. And I dropped the phone like a hot potato. I'm like, there's no way I'm doing a startup again. <laughs> I don't want to, you know, deal with, uh, you know, HR and, and investors and, and all of that uh, complexity. Uh, so then I called some buddies of, of mine at Watson and I said, you know, steal this idea, put it in Watson. He's like, hold on, let me get you over to the um, uh, Watson uh, speech CTO. Uh, and I was talking to, uh, David and I'm like, Hey, here, here it is. Steal it. And he's like, that's a great idea. Um, uh, I'm resigning and joining you. <laughs> and I'm like, you can't do that. There's nothing here. I don't want to do this again. So I hung up the phone and then I called another uh, buddy of mine who was reporting to the CEO of Cisco. Uh, and he said, we'll buy it. I'm like, you can't buy it. There's nothing here. It, you know, I didn't file any patents, you know, I didn't incorporate this or anything of that sort. And I'm like, all of you are dooming me to do this <laughs> because, you know, you know, it's like triple vetted that there is something here. Um, and, and so I just started, you know, taking trips out west and, and meeting, you know, folks from my, my previous network and, and what have you to stress test it. And then, um, you know, by third, fourth quarter uh, later, later that year, we were uh, we were alive and kicking. Wow. So you you have this revelation, you scribble it on the back of a notepad, you wake up and then you start hitting the phones and calling your old network to uh to just you know essentially like guerrilla recruiting here at this point really trying to to get a team of of folks from your past life to align with you on this vision yeah and 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 that's what i you look when i meet lots of entrepreneurs they're like how do i know if it's you know if it's the right idea to really push forward on and i've always told them don't force it you know of course i wanted something in 2012 2013 2014 2015 right um, and I tried, right? I tried, you know, to to get a couple ideas uh, up and running as well, um, but you know, I, I, I didn't get any air from them, right? You know, think of the Wright brothers, right? It just wasn't lifting. This thing was 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 like a lightning bolt, uh, and and I knew, I was sure, 
I was sure that this was going to be a thing. And then I could go and meet with a hundred venture capital firms in a, in a row and, and be tireless about it because I was as sure uh, as I was with the last idea. Because remember, last idea, first time founder, everybody's telling you this is impossible. It's not going to work. This is stupid. There's no business case, all of these things. And every time I got hit with that, I'm like, no, you know, it's, it's gnawing at me. And remember, some of the people that weren't sure about it were Marissa Mayer, who was at Google, Andreessen, right? Um, you know, uh, Guy Kawasaki, right? It was the throwing barbs, you know, at that first tech crunch. And no matter, no matter what people slung in my direction, I'm like, no, this is going to be a big deal. I, like, I, I felt it in my bones. And I think, you know, what you tell people is, and, and, and this is the intersection between creativity and, and the science of, of what we do, of, of what everybody, right, even listening is, is doing as well. This is the art piece, right? This is, this is where, um, you know, you, you, you literally feel it. You literally feel it. And it's no different than a musician that's in between albums and just needs, needs to get into that, or, you know, a writer that's experiencing a block, but then all of a sudden, all the ideas, you know, for their, uh, for their creation, just start flowing like crazy. And it literally is the same for startups. I, I, I don't like when people try to position, you know, STEM and, and, and the arts as two different things. It's all just one giant thing, because try, try to tell me that, 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 you know, you can you can put a piece of metal between the two sides of your brain and not have them talk to each other. Yeah, I can tell, you know, um, just inflection in your voice, you know, how, how um, that voice, my voice recognition of your voice, uh, how passionate you are uh, when it comes to the, you know, the idea. And um, I think that passion, you know, you got to have that uh, you got to have that conviction of, of, you know, your your vision and, and your idea to to take that to the next level, um, you know, and, and to, you know, to sell that to others, uh, to get, to get those folks on board. And it sounds like you were able to assemble a, a pretty, you know, all-star cast here in the early stages of Pryon, uh, to really dive into, uh, I guess you would say it was like that R and D phase again. Yeah. And, and, and look, you're exactly right. I remember there was this one IBM executive that I was interviewing with when I wanted to leave, leave. Uh, leave the speech team because I wasn't making uh, progress there. And he interviewed me and, and didn't give me the job, uh, didn't give me the product management or business development job. Months later, he invested in the, in, the, in, in, the, in the company. And the impression that I get, and I've heard this several times, um, you know, from, from VCs and, and, and no offense met, uh, you know, by this turn of phrase, but they said, you know, we know that you're onto something when you're glowing like a pregnant woman. You know, it's like you can just tell. Right. And so when you meet entrepreneurs out there, you can already, you can tell whether they believe it or not or whether they're just spouting crypto nonsense or whatever the buzzword bingo is of, of, of the day uh, as well. Yes. And and then starts R&D product development, throwing, uh, you know, think of the Swedish chef in the kitchen. Right. That's what happens in year one. That's what happens in year two. This is the product market fit. Now, you can try to stack the deck in your um, in your favor, like in our case, you know, we were blessed to uh, take an early investment by Engage Ventures uh, down in Atlanta area, which was a combination of, of a number of great American brands, uh, you know, folks like, um, you know, Coca-Cola, Delta Airlines, uh, UPS, uh, Georgia Pacific uh, and the like. So it was an early proving ground where we can uh, essentially work with them in our test kitchen. Uh, if you will, to help to get to that product market fit um, uh, more uh, effectively. Uh, and so we had that. Um, but, you know, I have to tell you, it's, it's something that you keep knocking your, your head against a, a wall. Uh, and, then, and then in hindsight, it appears obvious, you know, once, once you get to it. But it takes a lot of work by everybody. And so that was a couple of years uh, kind of finding that, that product market fit. Um, and, you know, this... To, to bring things to the, to the current stage, um, you know, you've, you've found your product market fit. Um, can you describe that for, for our listeners of, of, I wouldn't say it takes a couple of years. I mean, it practically takes half a decade. Hmm. Uh, it practically takes uh, half a decade, but you know, those of you that blink too early, you don't, you don't build anything. I mean, if you look at, you know, some of the big brands that we take for granted, like DocuSign and Atlassian and, and, um, 
just anything out there, Zoom and the, and, and the rest, before there were household names, there was 10 years of obscurity where what they're doing is adapting and changing, um, uh, you know, changing their approach to solving their respective Rubik's Cube until they finally get to that, boom, they have it. And then they can build a proper go to market to rinse and repeat, you know, um, you know, what they found a hundred times over, you know, and get solutions engineer, sales engineering, you know, you know, product, uh, product marketing, product management, communications, all completely aligned, creating webinars, knowing exactly who to hire, both on the business team and on the technology team to take advantage of what they found. But it, it takes a long while and it's not like a number. Right. Where you can tell people, hey, do do exactly this for for 24 months and then this will happen and that will happen. No, I mean, there's 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 no shortcut to uh, to comedy, you know, and in some cases it's like a it's like getting that prefrontal cortex and it and, you know, it comes in for different folks, you know, at different times. It's a great point. It's constantly kind of iterating on that product market fit and making sure that. Uh... You're not getting too comfortable with, you know, stagnating here on on who it's for and and, and the use case because uh, it's you know we're also in a very a very uh, um, a world that's changing so quickly. Um, you know, you you think of of technology. So you you made a great point there of like Zoom that product market fit. You know, pre COVID, um, it's very different than it is you know in today's uh, current stage. So. Um, so let's, let's, uh, you know, talk a little bit about, you know, what's, what's happening at Prion today. I'm, I'm, uh, excited to, uh, you know, to, to be able to collaborate with you all and to, to call you all a partner. Um, I'd love to, you know, hear it from you firsthand in terms of, you know, what would you say are some of the, you know, the most exciting things that, uh, technologists can expect if they were to, you know, come in and, and work with a company like Prion? Yeah. And, and, and I think, you know, where I appreciate our collaboration as well is the fact that, you know, you know, with with your uh, capabilities, with your network, with your team, we're able to open up the aperture and essentially uh, deliberately mix things up and get people from more varied backgrounds uh, to intersect with us as well. Because, you know, if we get it stuck into a group think where we're essentially reinforcing this the same style of engineers and scientists then, you know, we're not going to be able to see, um, you know, all the way around us uh, as well. So I appreciate that. And that's and that's deliberate, right, where we wanted to essentially start seeing past our noses, uh, uh, if, if you will. So I think it's just, you know, continued investment in engineering. And the, and the th major theme there is enterprise hardening. Right. It's one thing to cook a novel engine or platform. Right. And, and what we what we created is something brand new to enterprise software. So it's going to be a new category and and we're defining the attributes of leadership in that new category. Um, you know, that's what Gardner is calling it. That's what, you know, Sam Palmasano, the ex uh, IBM CEO is an, uh, is an investor here and an informal advisor. So it's something new. But at the same time, it has to be a native citizen of the enterprise software stack. So it still has to connect to everything uh, else. Think, think of an iPhone, right? When we first experienced it, it was this great consumer device, but it was many years until enterprises could adopt it because they needed certain types of crypto in there, they, um, uh, security, uh, MDM, VPNs, all of, all, all of these man, ad, admin and manageability things. And it's the same thing. So there's a lot of engineering about now taking what we have and then making sure that it, it wires into all of the existing applications that an enterprise has and meets the security and, and administration uh, expectations that they have as well, their SLAs, uptime, uh, and things of that sort. So that's what the engineering team is focused uh, on. Um, lots more um, requirements about how is the system operating? You know, what's its health? Are there any sort of automated reports that it can kick out in order to help people manage um, uh, the operations of it on the research team. Um, it's, it's, uh, one of the things that's really exciting to, um, uh, you know, scientists that, that inspect, uh, an opportunity here is curiously, they may be coming from Amazon and Google and Facebook and these style of companies, they come here and they're like, Holy smokes, I don't have to give anything up because we this team is literally working on every element of, of, uh, 
of the AI stack you, you would ever be interested in. And what's really interesting, and, and I've, I found this, what's counterintuitive is you think that you go join a big uh, tech company and, and you have this wide aperture of portfolio that you tend to. But everybody forgets you get assigned things. And then you get pigeonholed. And then you have to work on that one you know, TPF report or that widget for the rest of your, rest of your life. Um, and whereas here, you can say one day I'm spending on this engine, this day I'm spending on that engine, this other day I'm spending on this uh, patent, this other day I'm working on this. So you have a little bit more flexibility to follow your flow, uh, if you will. Um, and one of the things that I'll, I'll remind uh, everybody in the audience is this. Even if there's some asset uh, in a portfolio of a big tech company that you have to compete with, don't forget that they may have assigned people that are dispassionate uh, about that, that element in the portfolio to work on it. And they'll hit their MVP in their requirements list, and then they'll move on to something else, and that thing will uh, eventually atrophy. When you come to Prion or any any of your uh, respective companies that are working on on different elements of of uh, tech, we love what we do, and we can say that, and it's and it's not contrived. We literally do. If there was no money in this, we would st still be doing it, and we've been doing it for 10, 20, 30, 40 years. So counterintuitively, what ends up happening in startups, especially early on, right, when you're still looking at at companies that are still, you know, less than 100 people, less than 75 people, less than 50 people, you're finding missionaries that really adore what they do, uh, and they bubble over it. We like using our product. We we're wowed using it. We're delighted using it. If something crop up, crops up, people will fix it. And it's not a task. It doesn't feel heavy. Uh, to us, we'll we'll check in code at at midnight on Saturday night. I mean, and and it's not heavy and it's not a burden. It's it's like going to a child and asking if they're tired of playing uh, with Legos or other toys that they uh, that they like, literally. And that's and that's what you should seek. Go somewhere where where it feels the same. You know, it's like go ask a teenage uh, uh, boy to stop playing uh, a video game. Oh, are you tired of doing that? Of course they're not. They're enjoying that. That's you know, a, go ask them if they're they're tiring of recording music or a painter if 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 they don't want to you know work on a canvas anymore, right? It's not work. Yeah, that's great. I love how you uh, how you paint that picture. Um, takes me back to my childhood. You would not get me off of you know any sort of uh, video game uh, until three or four in the morning so um it, it sounds like an environment that uh folks uh all seem very passionate about i i agree with you i think that's super important um you know they feel like they're all working towards a a, a problem that is uh, is worth solving um in terms of you know soft skills or or some of these characteristics um that you really value uh, within, uh, you know, somebody joining your team. One of the things that I always um, vouch for is loyalty. I think that's one of the most important characteristics of somebody that's, that's joining a, a startup because you're going to go through some tough times. You know, it's not always peaches and cream and, and, and for the folks that can kind of stick through the thick of it. Um, you know, I, I really admire that and I, I um, you know, look for that and I, and I try to, identify with folks that um, sh share sim and com similar common grounds. Are there any characteristics that you really value uh, for folks that are joining the company from a characteristics soft skill perspective? Oh, goodness. Um, you're, you're, you're right. And almost, you know, we talk about these things even as tech companies, but psychology really drives everything. You know, people make emotional decisions before they make, um, you know, intellectual ones. Um, you know, what, what you said about loyalty. I mean, it's, you know, you have to be, to be loyal to yourself, you have to be loyal to others. You know, I was joking with, uh, with somebody yesterday. It's like, well, you know, you know, when's the last holiday that you'll take? And I'm like, uh, nothing until there's an outcome. I just can't, I, I can't, I wouldn't even enjoy it because I know somebody's on watch and other folks are working on things and uh, I'm actually too excited. And I want to, I, I feel like I would miss here, here's actually a nice metaphor. I feel like I would miss a, a moment of the child learning to walk, right? I feel like I would actually miss something important 
right? Where it's like, oh, look at what happened. You know, we we solved this problem or we gained this customer or this, you know, this other thing was discovered. And I almost actually would would miss it um, and and uh, and kick myself for it. I would say we spend a lot of time talking uh, to folks and I tell them um, by the time they get to me, I say you're instantly hired. So this isn't an interview. What you're what you need to do now is interview me and 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 figure out whether I would be a good steward of your career with a team that would be enveloping you and mentoring you and things of that sort. Turn the responsibility around on me. Right. Uh, and that way it just, you know, kind of e- eases the burden. There's no you know, stress or anything of that sort. And you, and it starts making you think differently about, you know, what you're doing, what you're always trying to do is, is a Nash equilibrium, right? You know, in order for you to have the best outcome, everybody else has to have that best outcome around you as well and find the equilibrium in that. So I, I think we're always looking for people uh, that, that think that way. If you try to uh, optimize for yourself, everybody else is in trouble. If we optimize for everybody else and not for you, then you're in, you're in trouble as well, and the whole system starts failing. And so we, we really think about you know how thoughtful are folks that are that are coming in, self directed. That I, I I tell you, I mean, we had you know an individual just start um, on Tuesday, uh, yeah, literally on Tuesday, um, before the end of the week, I already saw their fingerprints on things. And and the work was perfect and no feedback and, 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 and things of that sort. I can tell you one of the hardest things when you're jo- joining early stage companies is people like me, you know, tend to meddle in, in things like that. Not in a bad way, not not in a, um, um, what are they called? Not in a micromanaging way, but we really, you know, care so much about everything, just like Steve Jobs talked about braiding cables and, and things of that sort, that when you finally back off. And you start trusting everything and not editing anything that's coming out of communications or or what the sales engineers are doing and what other folks are doing. That's that's a special moment in a, in a company. That means you know people are self directed and they got this. And and I can tell you, I'm I'm just pleasantly surprised then because it kind of frees me up for the things that I need to be focused on, which is hey, what's the company need to look like three months from now, six months from now, twelve months from now, five years from now. Um, and it's always a special moment when I just start seeing the machinery working with the leaders in their, in their own right. Um, and, and so that's one of the top things that I look for is just self-motivated, self-directed people that are, you know, having fun, they're passionate about what they do and it's never a burden to them because I can tell you if it ever starts being a burden, they need to go somewhere else where it's always playtime for them. Mm -hmm. Like I literally tell Googlers when they come here, I'm like. This better be your 100, um, you know, that that 20 percent time that they used to have. I'm like, your next role, it should feel like 100 percent time. Literally, it's 100 percent play time. That's what it needs to feel like. And I don't mean that in in some sort of, um, you know, way that we're not building a business and we're not trying to hit goals and be successful and things like that. There's a way to do that and still get people to think. And, and this is another thing, uh, I, I, actually, this is a very important point. When people come in front of us, I tell them, don't bring part of your CV here. You know, if this is only, you know, leveraging some of the experiences that you had in the last year or two, or maybe something that you did three or four years ago and blah, blah, blah. No, don't be here. You know, what I'm trying to do is leverage the totality of your experiences and who, who you are as a person. For instance, one of the engineers you sourced uh, uh, for us, right? You know, was working in technology, but prior to that, um, you know, he was a nurse. Prior to that, he was in the military. And guess what? I have healthcare environments and other types of environments that are looking at adopting this technology. So not only did I get an engineer, you know, out of out of working with the Hatch team, I got somebody with varied experiences uh, behind the scenes. And one of the things that I told them is. I'm not interested in you just being an engineer. I'm interested in you being this more complete person that's going to bring some novel intuition as we develop, uh, you know, solutions for for some of these industries as well. That's one of the top things that I look for is 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 not uh, folks with horse blinders on. I love that. Yeah, it's um, 
looking at somebody's, you know, their whole package, right? It's not what have you what have you been tinkering with in the last year or, you know, just just show me your your GitHub repo, you know, from the last six to twelve months. You you really wanna unbundle, you know, their entire ex- experience and what they've seen and how that can contribute. Um, I, I can totally relate to what you're saying too with regards to the it's tough to 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 remove yourself from things uh, as a as a uh, as an executive uh, founder. Uh, you work so closely with it, um, and and you're really good at it. And to um, to trust uh, that that is something that can be taken over by somebody else is a tough thing to 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 ask. You know, we're dealing with it right now, actually, with regards to. You know Kevin and and some uh, uh, some of our leadership, um, but I would say that uh, you know folks value that they they value that uh, that that you trust them and you know you you have that level of respect that they can they can do what you were doing and 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 uh, do it equally as as well um, and uh, allow for you to take on that next role of ex- expansion and scale, um, which which it sounds like we're we're making progress there and I'm excited to hear that. Um, what does the the future of Prion look like? Um, I know that's a, such a a tough question. I mean, when, you know, when people, you know, even our own team members are like, "Hey, what's you know, what's the one year, three year, five year plan?" Um, right. You know, that's that's a that's a handful to 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 answer. But I am curious on on what some of your future plans look like with Prion. Yeah, and and before that, just building on on what you said, uh, I'll tell you a pet peeve, right? So I don't want to just say positive things. I'll give you this one little aside. My pet peeve is when people approach and they call themselves experts in anything. There's no such thing. You know, don't get on a podium talking about how you're smarter than generals or things of that sort. <laughs> you know who I'm talking about. But there, you know, when 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 a LinkedIn message gets thrown and somebody says they're an expert in X, Y, and Z, all the experts that I know, the biggest experts in any field that I've encountered, would never call themselves that. They will say that they're eternal students and at the last, you know, second of our lives, looking up from deathbeds, we will say we knew knew nothing and we experimented and we kept growing and and things of that sort. That's a common theme that I've seen, uh, you know, people that, um, you know, that, um, um, you know, express themselves properly. So that's a big warning sign to me is when people come in and say they're experts because all of innovation is is living and breathing and adapting and, and and what have you. As far as you know, what what are the plans uh, for these uh, company as well? It's to continually grow uh, and adapt itself. Right now, we have a very focused go to market that you know you know we we we're executing on uh, in order to find the appropriate landing spot in in um, uh, these enterprises, and then we'll eventually expand. Uh, from there as well. So we have a very focused plan for doing that so that we can unlock our next phase of, of funding and then grow uh, even more. And so continued uh, technical recruiting on both the engineering side and on the research side to make that happen. Um, I can tell you our, our um, you know, applicant tracking system, I mean, we were reached almost 5,000 resumes where it got so big in terms of a database, in terms of interest, you know, you know, we, we brought in your team, of course, to help us, you know, you know, filter this, you know, as an out of body experience in some ways, because it just became, um, you know, just too burdensome to, to review that. But I think we're looking for folks that have that X factor that can bring art and science as a, as a proper blend that are more complete individuals that will come in and, and, and find joy in, in, in what they do. And I can tell you the thing that drives me that's that's perfect, uh, per, uh, interesting to me is a dual thing. Step one, it's literally creating this b- brand new experience so that, um, you know, you can't go wrong trying to open up the aperture and reduce the distance between people and knowledge. That's my fixation. And then my second uh, a fixation uh, is for the people that entrusted us, you know, with with this journey for them to have a, a, a life uh, altering experience. You know, that's what we were able to do for folks, uh, in, in our last venture. Uh, and I'm, um, you know, devoted to that as well, because I think if you can mint more copies of, of people that are, um, you know, in, in independently capable, 
guess what they end up doing? They go out and support their communities. They go support their, uh, you know, academic institution, you know, nonprofits and the like. These are, you know, typically good people that get access to this uh, capital. And, uh, and the more of those uh, style of individuals we can mint, the better. Yeah, well said. Um, well, in closing, I guess, you know, what are, what are some of the immediate positions that Prion's hiring for today? Yeah, so uh, we have, um, I think, uh, backend engineering, full stack uh, engineering, security engineering. Um, those are some of the important roles on that side. Uh, and then research engineers and then research scientists um, on, on, um, on that side of the house as well. So those are, you know, probably the five key roles uh, that we're focused on right now. All right. Well, Igor, um, thank you so much for spending some time with us. Uh, I personally am taking a lot of notes over here on my end that, uh, you know, just your story, it's inspiring. Um, you know, we're super proud to call Prion a customer. Um, and, you know, we're just super thrilled for the future of, of what you all are building and uh, looking forward to, to see where, where this thing goes. Um, thank you so much for spending some time with us. And, and uh, yeah breaking down the, your shield and showing us, uh, you know, a little bit of who Igor was, uh, uh, getting to this point. We really appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks for having me.